Can you see my slide? Yes, we can see it. It's it's up and to scale. Okay, thanks very much. And thank you, Clarissa, Roshni, uh, and my fellow panelists. And most importantly, thanks to the audience. Um, thanks um, for the last presentation. Um, I think the last presentation talks more about what the plan is all about when it comes to land. Um, but in my presentation, I'll be looking at the relationships or summarize the actual justification on why we should actually consider land as a big factor in the climate change uh, discourse, whether it's for uh, mitigation or for adaptation. So the title will be Relationships, Paradoxes, and Opportunities. I begin with an introduction, and the introduction comes around the issue of land use and land tenure. Because we will speak about land, um, land tenure, it's about relationships, relationships not just with the physical environment, but most importantly, with the people, communities, and all the um, issues around us. And land tenure in this relationship has three key components. When we um, deconstruct it, uh, what we tend to see is that when we talk about land, uh, there are users of land, and these people are individuals, communities, authorities, corporations who use the land. And then there is the issue of institution, the policies and the rules and management and administrative matters that relate to how we use the land, uh, what we should use it for, and why we should use it in the first place as well as where. And then there's the issue of the land, which is the actual object, um, the physical object. And of course, it comes along with non-physical matters. So when we look at land as the earth surface, which is the physical and the institution, and then the people and users of land, what we tend to understand here is that it is a relationship that needs to be governed. And so we speak about land governance. But the key issue here is that it relates to how land is used, how it is transferred, held, inherited, and managed. And when we look at um, these tenural issues, one begins to understand that the capacity to cope, adapt, and recover uh, with regards to climate change or even land degradation in general, you know, has a lot to do with tenure. So land use and tenure are the key words here. So what I'll do next is to connect climate change and land or tenure relations. To do that, there are two ways to look at um, climate change and land relations. One is the issue of the greenhouse gases. Land is a holder of greenhouse gases. So land stores three times as much CO2 as the atmosphere, and 98% of the CO2 stored on land are in forests. About 2.6 billion tons of carbon dioxide, which is about one third of CO2 from other sources, is absorbed by forests each year. So with this, it matters that when we speak about climate change, we cannot negate the issue of land if the land is actually um, the object or the factor that holds or that can hold most of the CO2, which is or the greenhouse gases we want to reduce. Then there is the issue of land as an emitter. So land is the, you can say land is the judge and also land is the criminal here. So about 77% of the agricultural land on the planet is directly used for raising animals. And that's where the methane comes. And that's also where the cotton trees comes in. And so we all know that agriculture itself is um, the main reason why we cut quite a lot of trees in terms of deforestation. And so Land, you can say there is, I'm not trying to criminalize land here, but the factor here is the use. And that is where the human factor comes in. So land holds the CO2 and the human factor also means that land and how we use it contributes to climate change. And when you look at the diagram here, the, um, you know, in terms of the greenhouse gases, you'll see that carbon dioxide is 75% in terms of sources. And um, methane is 17%, which comes from animal farming. When you put these two together, we're already hitting nearly 90%. And so that's how land relates to climate change. Now, it's not just about this relationship, but it's also about the justification 
So there are the paradoxes, one of the reasons why land matters in the climate change discourse, which is something I think we've um, negated for a while, is also because the main problems that need to be resolved in order for climate change to be mitigated or to be improved all relate to land. And these are things that I call paradoxes. For instance, I've identified three paradoxes here. One of them is that rearing livestock reduces cropland while producing less than 20% of calories. So um, we rear livestock, uh, we still need to uh, you know, attain food security, but how do we compromise the future of livestock farming? which is central to the survival of billions of people around the world in order to reduce methane emission, which is a necessity for mitigating and uh, reducing climate change effects. That's a big question. I don't have an answer to it and it's open to discussion, but it's also a reason why those of us within the land sector or who work you know, in land related professions need to begin to be more creative and innovative as to finding climate solutions. The second paradox is that both rearing livestock and cropland reduce forest, but then how do we reduce cattle rearing to conserve land while hoping to produce enough meat for the daily calories needs of current and future generations? We are told not to cut forests, um, but again, we need meat, we need food. How do we actually balance this? It's a big question for us. The top paradox is that reducing agricultural land is necessary for conserving forests to mitigate climate change. But how are governments expected to put policies in place to ban deforestation when every parcel of farmland is essential for producing more food and for conserving animal and plant species? That's the third paradox. Again, I don't have an answer to this, but it's for us to understand that if we're to mitigate adapt or do whatever to climate change in terms of reducing its impact or its negative impact on humanity, the issue of land starts at the center of the discussion or should be at the center of the discussion. And it means that as land professionals, we have a big responsibility here. Now, I can only speculate at the moment that in order to solve those paradoxes, one thing we need to bear in mind is the need to manage the bundles of rights that exist on land, including the interests and you know, all the quantum of restrictions that are necessary as well as obligations, how we manage them matters because the solution to climate change effect should be land use. It requires managing and administering land rights to mitigate vulnerabilities, costs, or that we, we have because of climate change. So how those who have them, who have land in this, in this sense, exercise their rights matters in mitigating, adapting, or managing climate change effect. Again, this is a speculative solution, but it's clear that from literature that this has worked for land degradation and for other land matters, and all of these are intertwined, and we have to face the same issue here. So it's about managing land tenure or the governance of tenure. Now, finally, I would like to present why there are specific linkages to the climate issue with regards to land. And this is coming from a work I did from the UNCCD on land degradation. I realized that if land is an object of restoration and is an object of degradation, then land is doing the same also, or will do the same for climate change. So one thing that is clear is that People who have long-term rights or obligation on land are more likely to use the land and forest for more productive, uh, more productive means following um, climate change rules. And climate change rules will be determined by tenure. The other is that if people do not have secure titles or provable documentation on land, they are on land they are using, they will not follow climate change mitigative rules because they have no defined responsibility to do so. This is has turned out to be the majority of the case based on work done um, by UNCCD. On other matters, the capacity of a forest to act as a carbon sink, as, as already mentioned earlier, increases with the forest rate of growth and its ability to retain the carbon on permanent basis. 
But this cannot happen if tenure rules are not secure. So it depends on adherence to climate change tenure rules. In conclusion, I'd like to state that for us to move on, we must, it's important that we have to follow fit for purpose approaches because what works for community A may not work for community B. And currently um, the fit for purpose sets its um, key principles around special framework, institutional framework, as well as legal framework. But I think we need to um, emphasize the social framework as well as the behavioral framework because it's about change of behavior as well. And from Prindex, the last Prindex, um, the last Prindex data, it shows that even people that have documentation in Africa still do not feel secure. And there must be a reason for that. I think it's something to do with behavior. I don't know what you think, but I'm hoping that we can have the discussion going forward. So thanks very much. And I'm looking forward to having a discussion. Thank you, Clarissa.